seats. We will begin this meeting shortly. I'm Councilmember Jose Wiesar. We've been joined by Councilmember Marquise Harris Dawson, Councilmember Englander, and Councilmember Price. This is the Planning and Land Use Management Committee. We'll call the meeting to order. First item on the agenda is the multiple items agenda. This is an opportunity for individuals wishing to speak on more than two items or more. They get the opportunity to speak for two minutes on those items. So the first speaker is Herman, items one through 12. Well, now that we're on item one with the obligation of Plum under the federal and state law, even Plum has to comply with the mighty state laws that it violates under ADA because of what we call planning and oral status reports of ongoing development. Well, already the ADA under affordable housing is suing the local entities for abuse, fraud, and worst case scenario, abuse of public funds for the amenities promised by overdevelopment. Didn't you say you're going to developing for the homeless? <laughs> and then the failure to comply, which under Title II of the ADA, even after entering into a project of civil compliance for access agreements, you violate Plum and the city law. And then I go into item number 10 of that of the Dibble Dwarf, CD 1233, possible potential residential lots for one open space. Fuck you. That's not the good use of open space. And then I go into Mr. Rooster Boy, Mr. Price there. You need to help this lady here who's losing her home because we're going to build this Lucas Museum and you're going to evict this woman who has a disabled child. Another regulation of what? Undiscrimination. Under discrimination. You need to help Miss Irma, Mr. Price. No one wants a museum if you're going to use the Holocaust action of evicting people who can't afford the rent in L.A. and push them out. That is fucked up. Item... Uh, Mickey Jackson, item two, I'm sorry, four and two, is that correct? Mickey Jackson? The traffic jam here puts me to mind of driving on our streets. I um, wanted to talk about a couple of things that are happening here. Item two, we have had numerous articles uh, probably the first one was uh, from Patrick McDonald in the Weekly a number of years ago about what has been dubbed black lung lofts. And we're me meaning things that are where people will live, especially children, anywhere near a freeway. We know, we cannot pretend we do not know this. And so while every, all humanity considered, I would say you should not be doing this, but if that is not a consideration uh, sufficient to influence decisions here, if it cannot overcome money, then let's talk money. Knowing what you know, being informed of how dangerous this is, allowing it to go forward could set the city up for some interesting lawsuits in the future. Did the city enable this? Did the city endorse this? Did the city pass things to do this? And disregarded all safety warnings. And, you know, things are kind of moving more in that direction in litigation, if you've noticed. And uh, I just think it's highly irresponsible on a human level, most of all, but, but it's also fiscally irresponsible for the city to engage in this. I'm also concerned further engaging in uh, the environment and not caring much about the environment and trying to weaken anything 
that has anything to do with helping people live in a difficult environment. I believe that item four is piecemealing CEQA, is trying to undermine the, the um, CRA agency, the, the, take, the agency that took over the CRA. And I oppose item four. Thank you very much. Your time is up. Thank you. So now on the consent calendar, we have item number three, which is the periodic municipal code updates amendments. Item three, we will move without objection. I don't, yes, sorry sir. to interrupt you, Councilman. On item three, we need to request the city attorney to prepare the ordinance. And we will request the city attorney to prepare the ordinance, okay? So it, it'll go to council, Councilman, just to be clear with that directive. Okay. Thank you. So we will approve that item without objection. Item five, site plan review code amendments regarding CRA LA activity. We will move without objection. So ordered. Yes, do you have a question or do you want to, okay. Item seven was on consent. We have a public comment card, two of them actually. So if you could call item seven to order, please, Mr. Mejia. Item seven. Yes, Councilman. Item seven is a city attorney prepare draft ordinance. Uh, it's a development agreement between the city and USC for a term of 10 years. Yes, sir, Mr. Cedillo. Sure. Um, after this item, we will reconsider that. Item seven, we could call Gene Frost and William Chen from the mayor's office. Item seven. Good afternoon. My name is Gene Frost. I chair the policy committee of the uh, NANDEC, the North Area Neighborhood Development Council. We are here to strongly support the uh, bringing the Lucas Museum to Exposition Park. I'm a 38-year resident of the area. I love the park. This will be a great addition. It does no harm. It's not destroying anything. It's a great, a great facility, and we strongly support it. And on behalf of the Neighborhood Council, I urge you to do so as well. Thank great. you. Thank you. And we are taking up item seven, which is a development agreement for USC, we have another item on the Lucas Museum on item eight. So, William Chen from the mayor's office. Pass. All right. Oh, here it is. Okay. So, we will move item seven. Any objections? See none. So ordered. Yes. We will now go back and reconsider item number five without objection. Mr. Cedillo. Only that this is a, uh, a matter that, uh, that we've been uh, looking at in terms of site plan review. Mm -hmm. And we have a motion that uh, asks the planning department to make recommendations on, on amending the, the number uh, of units that would be eligible for it. Uh, clearly, at this moment, 50 units uh, is the threshold. And we've had some experiences within our district. So, for example, when we first came in, there were 80 units of affordable housing that uh, had this threshold been higher, those 80 units would be built today. But, in fact, uh, in part because they weren't, in part because of CEQA abuse, uh, we now have the same three parking lots. We're short 80 units of housing. That's approximately 250 people who would be housed. Uh, and it's just simply not working for us, I think. We, as I say, on, all, on so many other of these matters, we need more frequent review of the laws that we are working with to make sure that they're serving the interests of the city. So I'm just uh, wondering when we can get a report back from planning on our request. Mr. Bertoni. Uh, thank you. Uh, Patricia Diefender for Kevin Keller. Craig Weber. How about Lisa Weber? <laughs> 
afternoon, Council Members. Lisa Weber, Deputy Director with the Department of City Planning. We are currently working on that report back, Councilman, regarding a variety of uh, amendments and modifications to the way that we do site plan review. Th these amendments that are before you today are very limited in scope to address yes. some very specific issues. We do expect to be back in the fall uh, with that report back. Okay. I, I recognize that this is a more specific. I'm just using the opportunity, same subject matter, uh, and note that uh, we put the motion in in August of 2015. And we, what we will do, Mr. Cedillo, is work with the planning um, department and my staff and your staff and find out where that is and bring it to the forefront as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So noted. Staff, yes, you got it? All right. So we will um, move item five, and as was mentioned by Mr. Cedillo and our planning staff, this item... Um, the main thing it does is uh, fix a, uh, removes the CRA as the lead agency and some items dealing with um, our, uh, our site plan review process. So, but we'll, move, we'll get that information uh, to the forefront as soon as possible. Item five, we'll move that item without objection. So moving on, that leaves us now with item one on the regular agenda. Uh, the first item uh, is report from the Director of Planning, Vince Bertoni. Welcome, Mr. Bertoni. No report, thank you. Thank you. Item number two, if we could call that to order, Mr. Mejia. Uh, sure, Councilman. Item two is a motion, Wizar Corrette's in instructing uh, various city department agencies to report on the city's practices to address freeway, freeway pollution near um, development projects. Okay, staff here for a report. Thank you, welcome. Good, after Good afternoon, Tom Rothman from the Planning Department. Uh, I believe this is a motion requesting us to come back, but I'm happy to give a status update um, on our policies regarding freeway adjacency projects. We uh, last year did adopt, the, the City Council adopted our Clean Up Green Up Ordinance, which was a citywide ordinance um, that did require uh, a, a more advanced filtration systems, air filtration systems on projects that are uh, habitable and within a thousand feet of any freeway. So that is one uh, implementation policy that we have um, begun already and um, we do have a policy memo that does talk about uh, uh, increasing that at some point but right now we are just implementing that MERV 13 infil uh, filtration requirement for those projects. Okay, thank you and you mentioned the cleanup green up program and we there we established a air filtration requirements near freeways um, citywide how is that going? Is it in the implementation stage? Is it going well? Is it not? Yes, it's going very well. It's, that's just one component of the entire program. That program is essentially three pilot areas of environmental justice areas. One's in Pacoima, Boyle Heights, and Wilmington. Uh, the freeway adjacency is the citywide component of that. Um, but uh, as far as the, um, the actual pilot areas, we are implementing now much more stringent adjacency requirements for when a sensitive use is located next to a, uh, a subject use, which is much more uh, noxious in nature. So we are working on that. That is, a, that is our standard, uh, uh, you know, our standard zoning and building regulations at the moment. So we are implementing it. It's not, a, it's not a only through disc discretion. It's actually a by right requirement. So okay. every time a project does come into our counter, either our counter or building and safety, we do ensure that those, those adjacency requirements are tagged and appropriate measures are added to the project. And I think the Clean Up Green Up program had some report back requirements and we'll get the data and information at the appropriate time in Plum, correct? Yeah, we can that? certainly do that. And how about, well, the LA Times mentioned that more than 1.2 million people in Southern California already live in high pollution zones within 500 feet of a freeway. Do we have that type of baseline information for the city of LA and how many people live within three or 500 feet from freeways or is that something we need to develop? I, I'm sure we could 
we could gather that information. I don't have it at, at my hand at the moment, but I, I think we could probably figure out a way to gather okay. the data of number of dwelling units at least and census data for, for properties that are adjacent to all freeways. Okay. And we are, we are not currently addressing uh, this at this moment, correct? Uh, any, uh, con I mean, the, the fact that there are so many new developments going up near freeways, 500 feet within freeways, we don't have any policies on that at this time. Other correct? than the... Other than the clean other up, than clean the increased air, air filtration, filtration, no, we don't. Okay. And w the reason I introduced this is that it strikes me that after all the information that comes out, we have had report after report for decades on the detrimental impacts um, as we allow people to live ne near freeways. Um, and so it was concerning and we wanted to make sure that uh, we start developing a proactive policy on, on what this means. And so I understand it's gonna be a lot of work, but I think step by step we'll be able to more better address this. Um, so any questions on this for right now before I go to public comment? No, okay. Mr. Cedillo? Right. This. Um so the only thing that guides us, I believe, is a, a state policy and a state letter that provided guidance on this on this uh, uh, this subject matter. Uh, are you referring to the air filtration? Yes. That is no. That is a city uh, regulation that's in the LAMC today. It was adopted last year. So with that is a by right requirement now. But also, there's isn't there some guidance we get from the state on this matter on, in terms of siting? Um, there are some state require. There are some state guidelines, I believe, regarding state-owned property that's adjacent to the freeways. But as far as privately-owned properties, I'm not aware of any. Okay. You may want to look. Uh, I know that we've done research in our office with respect to because uh, there seems to be a void in this area in terms of of guidelines. There seems to be a series of practices, though, in terms of. Say, for example, hospitals, uh, many of the developers use the same standards uh, or protocols that the hospitals do, uh, triple yep. painting, landscaping, uh, et cetera, that uh, we may want to uh, look at what guidelines uh, are proposed through the state and how they relate to, to the developments, uh, people's choices, decisions to where they site, and people's decisions to where they choose to live. Okay, thank you. We'll go to public comment now, then we'll return to the item. Thank you for that. Michelle Pritchard, Zuli Juarez, Doug Haynes. Each individual has one minute to speak. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michelle Pritchard, and I'm representing the Liberty Hill Foundation. And I wanted to speak in favor of the motion uh, before you today on freeway pollution and health hazards. Uh, Liberty Hill, as you know, was a strong supporter of the Clean Up Green Up ordinance, which passed last year. And thank you for your partnership on that. Uh, and as we just heard from Mr. Rothman, uh, it helped to establish the uh, the MERV 13 air filtration requirement for all residential and commercial development within a thousand feet of a freeway. And we think that this is important progress, but it is not enough. Uh, we're glad to see renewed attention on this issue today, and we would like to really urgently, uh, we think there is an urgent need uh, to develop new and ambitious targets and rules for reducing freeway exposure, including retrofits of existing buildings that are close to freeways, buffer zones, stronger design standards, and additional measures to accelerate clean, renewable, non-fossil fuel-based transportation. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Uli Juarez, and I'm representing scientists at USC Keck School of Medicine. Through the Southern California Children's Health Study that began at USC in 92, it has been designed to understand the effects of air pollution on the development of school children. The evidence shows that children who live near busy roadways with high volumes of daily traffic are more likely to develop asthma, more likely to have more breathing symptoms, and more likely to have stunted lung development. Children who live within 500 feet of busy freeways on average had substantial deficit in lung functions. Emerging evidence shows that ro near roadway air pollution increases risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes. The scientific literature around the world demonstrates that the negative health effects of air pollution on children um, 
are more likely to get, to get sick and likely affect their health their entire lives. We therefore recommend the measure to be taken to assure that the new housing, new housing is developed away from roads to reduce risk of long-term effects. Thank you. Thank you. Doug Haynes, Yvette Lopez Ledesma, Lior Alpern, and Christopher Chavez. Hi, good afternoon. Doug Haynes with the East Hollywood Neighborhood Council and also Hollywood Citizens Neighborhood Council. I'm sorry, but the science does not support the proposals that I'm hearing. Fine particulate matter passes directly from the lungs to the bloodstream. It passes through door jams and window frames. There is no realistic way to filter it. Within 500 feet of a freeway, you have double the rate of autism, double the rate of dementia, double the rate of cardiovascular disease, and a significant lifelong decrease in lung capacity in children ages 10 to 13. Yet in my neighborhood, the land closest to the 11 freeway has the highest permitted residential zoning. Over 700 units are proposed or approved within 500 feet of the 111 freeway just between Santa Monica Boulevard and Hollywood Boulevard. Within 1,000 feet, over 2,000 residential units are currently proposed. In my neighborhood, children live next to freeways, they attend schools next to freeways, and their only park is next to freeways. We're also bound by the major state highways of Santa Monica Boulevard and Western Avenue. State law prohibits new schools next to freeways. The only way to stop this is to prohibit all construction next to freeways. Thank you. Thank you. Yvette Lopez Ledesma. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Yvette Lopez Ledesma, and I'm the deputy director of Pacoima Beautiful and a resident of the Northeast San Fernando Valley. I would like to thank Councilmember Jose Huizar for his leadership on environmental justice issues in our city. As a planner dedicated to environmental justice, I ask that you all take actions to ensure that the historic disregard and poor decision making that has shaped once thriving communities into EJ communities, environmental justice communities, doesn't continue. That as leaders, you do not fall into the trap of having your constituents pr compromise health over housing. Our community members will tell you the same story that the data will. Living near a freeway is hazardous to our health. Emissions, in particular diesel emissions, contribute to the respiratory issues, cancers, childhood obesity, low birth weight, allergies, and cognitive issues in our community. Living near multiple freeways, as we do in Pacoima, is an urban planning death sentence. As Angelinos who have lived through its smoggiest years and who want better planning, now is the time to lead with thoughtful planning mandates such as buffers, increased density, stronger air filtration requirements, increased tree canopy, air monitoring sensors, as well as increased accountability on behalf of the AQMD to the City of Los Angeles. Developers also have the responsibility to develop smarter and think about livability as it relates to LA and not a utopian dream. Thank it's time you. to hold agencies accountable and plan smarter. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Council Members and Staff, Lior Alpern representing the South Coast Air Quality Management District. Uh, the issue of near roadway emissions is one that our agency has dedicated significant resources to over the past several years, and we stand ready to work with city staff to uh, develop strategies when it comes to land use and other strategies so we can effectively deal with this public health issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members of the Plum Committee, first I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Chris Chavez. I'm the new Deputy Policy Director for the Coalition for Clean Air. I'll be working outside, alongside Dr. Joe Liu and Nidia Bautista in supporting policies that improve air quality locally and throughout California. I want to thank Council Member Wiesar for introducing his proposal, which would require the Chief Legislative Analyst to report on the city's strategies to, uh, to address freeway pollution hazards and how to improve those strategies. Residents live, that live near freeways are exposed to far more air toxins and particulate matter. As such, they are at higher risk for uh, health conditions such as cancer, asthma, and heart attacks. However, the Coalition for Clean Air urges the City Council to work with the environmental community in developing this report. To this end, the Coalition is willing to work with Los Angeles to help ensure that the recommendations in the report are as effective as possible. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you. That concludes our public comment. And again, this uh, motion was introduced to see what more we can do um, with respect to uh, people and developments near our freeway systems. We know the pollution that is emitted by that. We've heard some of the dangers. Uh, and what we've done in the recent past is to require filtration requirements for new developments near freeways. But this is asking our planning team and working with other departments to go back and see what else we can be doing. 
The city is working, moving towards expanding infrastructure for electric vehicles, which will help quite a bit. Uh, but we also have to uh, synchronize that and time that along with other things we can be doing now, such as designing um, our projects, uh, our planning procedures, so that even if we are finding that balance between building the necessary housing in the city with um, um, protecting those people who will live there, that balance needs to be sought after in either new uh, planning procedures or design and how we uh, construct those uh, developments. So thank you to our staff for your initial work. Uh, I have circulated a amending motion that will ask uh, us to view um, in more detail areas of our current practices, recommendations for improvements, and the status of helping transition to more electric vehicles throughout the city. So that motion has been circulated. Any other questions or comments? No, see none. So ordered. Councilman, Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we request that you modify the uh, the motion to inst to make it clear that the planning department is the lead in this endeavor, and you may want to also um, request the department to include this as part of its work program. So that okay. It's, so that it's um, something that they will report back on. Okay. So uh, we'll incorporate those recommendations on the motion to make, clarify that the planning department is the lead and secondly, that uh, we incorporate this into the work program of the planning department. And the motion has been- uh, can, you speak, can you speak into the microphone? Sure. It's hard to hear. The motion has been also duly referred to the health committee. Yes, and it's been duly referred to the health committee. We'll incorporate that as well. Any objections? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Thank you to the public speakers who came out today. Item four. Uh, item four, Councilman, this is a report from uh, the Planning Department relative to oil and gas operations at 10460 West Pico Boulevard, the Rancho Park drill site in CD5. Good afternoon, Chair and the City Council member, Jack Jones, Associate Zoning Administrator of the City Planning Department. Um, you could speak more into the microphone. It's hard to hear, I think. Um, yes. Sorry. Directly into the microphone. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and the Council members. Uh, this is Jack Zhang, the Associate Zone Administrator of the City Planning Department. Um, this is just a report back to the Council file, CF 17-0149. Uh, basically, Planning Department has prepared a report back to the Council on April 24th, 2017. Um, planning department recommend that the, um, the operator of the site, uh, Hillquist Beverly Oil Company, to uh, file for a plan approval so that the city can conduct a uh, condition compliance review with a public hearing. Now, um, this report was produced with uh, multiple city agents, uh, city agency effort, and multiple city agency have conducted joint department uh, inspection and and we engage in multiple meetings so to recommend um, the appropriate steps in dealing with this project and numerous violation was cited based on the uh, 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 on-site inspection. Um, on May 15th, the Department of City Planning sent out a notice to the uh, operator for them to file a plan approval with a deadline on um, June 14th, 2014. However, the operator has not filed such plan approval. Instead, they send a letter requesting additional time so that they can correct uh, the deficiency identified in the um, uh, report back to the council and, and, and also prepare a compliance, compliance report by June 30th, 2017. So June 16th, 2014, uh, 2017, the department has sent out a communication letter acknowledging the intent to submit the compliance report by June 30th, 2017, and that the plan approval still required. At this time, planning department is waiting for the compliance report for a review. Again, the plan approval with a public hearing is still required. Thank you. Great, thank you. We will move to public comment. Lou Zikstra, Ted Cordova, and Nikki Carlson. You wave your comments? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, 
Um, this was a report that um, Mr. Koretz requested and asked for an update on this issue. Um, we will uh, continue to be briefed on this item. Um, for now, we will continue the item and to get another follow-up uh, from planning staff in the near future. And um, we'll work with Councilmember Koretz's office to arrange for that scheduling. So with that, we will uh, now um, continue this item to a future date. Any objection? See none, so ordered. Item number eight. Item eight, Councilman, this is a report from the Planning Commission. Um, before you is a general plan amendment uh, request and also a amendment to the Coliseum specific plan. Staff here to present this item. Thank you, welcome. Good afternoon, honorable committee members. My name is Heather Bleemers with the Department of City Planning. The project before you is consideration of a general plan amendment and specific plan amendment in conjunction with the Lucas Museum of Narrative Arts. The museum will be located in the western portion of Exposition Park in the South Los Angeles Community Plan and the Coliseum District Specific Plan. On April 11th, the advisory agency approved vesting tentative track map associated with the project. And on May 18th, 2017, the City Planning Commission approved the project permit compliance review for the project. Neither of those approvals was appealed. The, um, the, so before you today is consideration of the general plan amendment to redesignate a portion of 39th Street abutting the property and a specific plan amendment to the Coliseum District specific plan to contain language relating specifically to the museum uses and functions. Um, that is the overall of the project. I believe that there are staff here from the applicant team that will provide a more um, illustrative overview of the project. Um, but I am here to provide any questions or answer any questions that you might have. And just one last thing with regard to the ordinance that is before you, there are some very minor clerical corrections that have been distributed to you for your review. And there is one section of the ordinance that has been updated to reflect and be consistent with the concurrent Coliseum renovation specific plan that was uh, before you last Tuesday. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, we will now go to public comment and the first speaker on public comment is the applicant, Don Basiagalupi. Bacchialupi, somewhere Good around afternoon, there. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Welcome. honorable council members and committee and members. One, one moment, um, applicants have five minutes to speak. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm yes, Mr. Price. be on the screen here. Okay, thank yes. you. My name is Don Bacigalupi. I'm the founding president of the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. It's a pleasure to introduce or reintroduce the project to some of you. Uh, this is a unique uh, institution, one of a kind in all the world, and an extraordinary once in a lifetime gift of our founder and philanthropist George Lucas and his family. Uh, as you can see, George Lucas uh, has a vision for uh, expressing the narrative content of works of art across many centuries, many media, many cultures, the idea that art has always been a form of communication uh, intended to tell stories, to communicate important individual, family, cultural, political, and other stories across uh, the ages. The museum begins with a gift from, a private gift from the family, the George Lucas family, to the public of many thousands of works of art that include works by iconic artists such as Norman Rockwell, one of the largest collections of the artist Norman Rockwell in existence, some very iconic works that tell stories of the 20th century. The museum will take that initial gift and build onto it with an extraordinary array of uh, objects that will diversify the collection. And as you see in the next slide, uh, works by artists such as Jacob Lawrence, perhaps the most important African-American artist of the 20th century, works like this that tell uh, morality tales to children. This was a body of work that Lawrence created in 1968 during the civil rights struggle using Aesop's fables to illustrate 
uh, very important uh, morality tales to children and to others. The museum also includes a very large and unprecedented collection of film archives from both film works that Mr. Lucas himself directed and many other iconic films going back to The Wizard of Oz and The Ten Commandments and many others. And these include things like storyboard drawings, costume designs, set pieces, and all the various arts that go into the making of films, film being one of the great narrative arts of our own time. The museum will occupy what is currently two asphalt parking lots at the western edge of Exposition Park, lots two and three shown here, and will replace uh, that, those acres of asphalt with acres of green space, usable and accessible parkland, as well as the museum itself. So there's the before shot here, and then the after uh, image, the rendering of what the building will look like. The building itself is designed by the very cutting edge architect Ma Yansung of Mad Architects in Beijing, uh, really uh, the most avant-garde architect in the world and becoming one of the most renowned in all the world. The building design, as you see, is a design of the 21st century of our own time. It's a design and a building that couldn't have been created a, a, a decade or two ago. It takes advantage of all of the most advanced technologies, and uh, both in design and construction. On the site plan, you'll see uh, the entire western strip of Exposition Park, looking here from the south side at Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard all the way north to Exposition Boulevard on the right. And as you see, the entire strip will be reconsidered as a green space and an extension of Exposition Park. The Sobral Field, currently toward the southern end of that strip, will be relocated at our expense and rebuilt with state-of-the-art uh, surfaces and new amenities uh, to the very southern edge of that strip. The two parking lots, as you, as you see currently, will become the museum plus 11 new acres of green space, usable, accessible parkland. And Jesse Brewer Park at the north end of that strip will be refreshed and refurbished as well. So the vision is to create an entire new addition to Exposition Park. On the next slide, you'll see uh, the view of that Sobral Field, the new Sobral Field at the southwest corner of the park opposite the Expo Center, a wonderful amenity currently in the park, and the beginning of the landscape design that will offer many gathering places accessible uh, passageways from the community into the park and into other amenities in Exposition Park. The design of the building, as I mentioned, is quite extraordinary and includes this entrance plaza, which is what will replace 39th Street. The, the plaza will become the main entrance point to the museum and its education center during uh, high volume traffic days uh, when events are happening at the Coliseum and elsewhere in the park. The street will still be activated for public egress. So there will be both uh, options, both as a pedestrian plaza and when needed as a vehicular egress. Another slide of the interior of the museum, the, the entrance lobby facing uh, the north, uh, as I mentioned, the extraordinary design, many public amenities for uh, everyone visiting the museum, a research library, theaters where films will be shown on a daily basis, the exhibition galleries both for the collection and for other experiences. And I'll just leave you with several of the community benefits that we've been working on working with the community in South Los Angeles, many of the stakeholders and many of the uh, elected officials to understand the needs of the community and to fit as best we can into that community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that presentation. William Chun from the mayor's office. William Chun with the Mayor's Office, uh, Council Members, thank you. I'll make this short and sweet. Um, you've kind of seen the public benefits, but um, just wanted to lend our uh, strong support for this project. Uh, besides what this museum is going to provide for the community and the city, I think it shows um, the city's ability to band together. So this has been a, a team effort, not just from all the city departments, but from the county, from the state. Um, so it's been a great effort for all of us to get together and turn this around and get this going. So again, um, just want to um, lend our strong support and hope you approve this project. Thank you. Billy Greer, Irma Villeda, or Villeda, and Larisha Franks. 
Welcome. Hi, thank you. I'm testifying on the right item now. <laughs> I represent the North Area Neighborhood Development Council. We are local stakeholders. We represent residents, tenants, USC, uh, business interests. We met with the uh, Lucas Museum folks both in committee and then uh, in a board meeting. The support was unanimous. We are very excited about this coming to our neighborhood. It is within walking distance for many of us and there's such a great uh, cohesion in the narrative of Exposition Park from its early days as a agricultural park through its Beaux-Arts period, through the Olympics, and now this creating a brand new landmark for the future. It'll be great for the community, and uh, thank you for our remarks being listened to. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm Billy Greer, and I'm here today in my capacity as vice chair of the California Science Center and Exposition Park Board. And we are, the, we are gubernatorial appointees with the responsibility of having oversight and policy direction of the park. And we also enact and approve the leases of the property in the park. Uh, the board is very, very excited about the plans for uh, the museum of, the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. Um, it will complement the wonderful world-class institutions in the park, the, our recreational, cultural, and educational facilities. And it's going to thrill, energize, and excite people that visit the park today and will certainly come in the many years ahead. So, say yes to the museum, and may the force be with you. Thank you. Irma? Good afternoon. My name is Irma Villela. Um, I just, uh, my first time here, so I don't know how I speak. Um, I just wanted up uh, because uh, they up my, my rent over there too much and I can't afford it. And uh, I need a help by my son. Um, they have probiotic discrimination and I need a move and I need a please rec uh, declaration with a disability assess. Um, I don't know if that's, that you can help me with that guys. So they up the rent, I can afford it. It's too expensive over there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Larisha Franks, Pastor Edward Anderson, Ron Miller, and Dale Goldsmith. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon to the members of the council. My name is Larisha Franks and I'm here on behalf of Community Coalition, uh, an organization that is also a member of the South Los Angeles Transit Empowerment Zone. Um, as a longstanding institution that has directly engaged thousands of residents, we can state with confidence that the proposed construction needs uh, required for the creation of the anticipated Lucas Museum of Narrative Art are welcome. Um, so that the many economic, cultural, and aesthetic uh, benefits the museum will bring to the community are realized. South LA has a history of producing musicians, visual artists, actors, and writers who use art as a medium to communicate the narratives of African Americans and Latinos in our neighborhoods. Community Coalition is excited about the opportunity for this history to be reflected in the museum. In recent years, Community Coalition has targeted outreach to local artists to bring them into the larger conversations regarding social and economic development needs. My, by engaging artists in this way, we have promoted greater social cohesion and community building between residents and artists. I just want to close by reiterating that um, it is the hope that the members of the council approve the proposed construction needs to bring the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art home to Los Angeles. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon, I am Pastor Edward Anderson here on behalf of the historic McCarty Memorial Christian Church. I am pleased to offer my support for the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. Narrative art or storytelling has a strong foundation in the faith community. It is through storytelling that we seek to inspire and teach, weaving personal narratives into a larger fabric of imagination and possibility. What a magnificent opportunity to have an institution dedicated to celebrating this important art form and to expand its accessibility for our students, local residents, and family. The Lucas Museum offers something for everyone. The community benefits extend from the art and exhibits to classes and trainings under its roof and up to the acres of green space that will encourage gathering and social interaction. 
In addition, a museum of, na of this nature will contribute significantly to inspiring and motivating our young people while building an inclusive community that promotes dialogue and understanding between people from all walks of life. I look forward to welcoming this one-of-a-kind treasure and to building a lasting imprint for our local community. I am very pleased to offer my full support for the Lucas Museum of Art. Please vote yes. Thank you. Ron Miller, Dale Goldsmith, Jarrell Thomas. Welcome. Good afternoon. Ron Miller, Executive Secretary of the LA Orange County Building Trades. On behalf of uh, over 100,000 hardworking men and women, we stand in full support of this project. Uh, we're working very close with the council office to facilitate a project labor agreement that's going to have good local hire, preference for veterans. This is a project that's truly good for the community and it's going to put a lot of folks to work. So we urge you to move this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, dear respected leaders of the city of Los Angeles, as a stakeholder and a leader in the South LA community, I am in full support on behalf of the Coalition for Responsible Community Development um, in support for the Lucas Museum. I believe that the Lucas Museum will help promote a rich historical and cultural history that resides in the South LA community. I also believe that this will be an opportunity for economic growth that will produce jobs and for our residents that deserve living wages. Um, this project will ha have a major impact on the youth by providing an educational and cultural venue that is located in their community, which will prevent them from having to travel to other communities where expenses may be a little higher than what they can actually afford. Um, I also believe that this project will catapult us past the South LA perception or stereotypes that's been portrayed inaccurately portrayed by media and movies. Um, South LA is a vibrant community and it deserves the best. If New York can have the Museum of Modern Art, Washington the Smithsonian, and West LA the Getty Museum, then South LA can have the Lucas Museum. Thank you. So before we proceed, uh, the city of clerk, you had an announcement to make regarding the agendizing of this item. So it's come to our attention that the wrong agenda may have been available in the back near the speaker cards. The correct agenda should read in bold, revised to return item four back on the agenda, council file 17-0149. The clerk has put copies of the correct agenda in the back and do apologize. Thank you. So, Mr. Price, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Members, thank you for giving me a, an opportunity to address you uh, today on a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity being proposed in South L.A. It's a project that, frankly, needs no introduction, the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. You've seen reports on TV, read about the proposed project in the newspapers. Would L.A. or San Francisco get the Hollywood ending they'd hoped for? From day one, we rolled out the red carpet for George Lucas and his wife, Melody Hobson, because we knew this was more than just a quote-unquote Star Wars museum, a common misconception, as you know. In the last several months, I've witnessed a community come together as one with a larger-than-life vision for the future and clear understanding of the legacy we want to leave behind. I sat across the table from local community leaders, stakeholders, uh, leaders from our Slate Z Prom Zone, uh, designation to di discuss the $1.5 billion investment and potential impacts on CD9 and beyond. I've spoken to George and Melanie about their charitable gift and its far-reaching effects. The largest private gift in our nation's history that will transform two parking lots into a state-of-the-art landmark complete with 11 acres of green space. One that also happens to create thousands of new jobs, new construction and permanent jobs. For my constituents, it's an opportunity for local hire in a low-income area starved for good-paying jobs. But it also means increased opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses. Once built, the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art is expected to draw more than 1.2 million visitors on an annual basis. Now, I grew up in, in, district, uh, in the 9th District where projects like the Lucas Museum uh, were unimaginable. Since being elected to the council, I've advocated for meaningful investments worthy of South LA. That's a big reason why Exposition Park is booming with developments that include the LA Football Club soccer stadium, a multi-million dollar renovation of the Memorial Coliseum, um, 
and the California Science Center is planning to construct a state-of-the-art pavilion uh, to house the Endeavour Space Shuttle. Now, uh, with your support, the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art will be a proud part of Expo Park. These are exciting projects, not for my district, but for all Angelinos. I stand ready to fulfill George and Melody's goal of inspiring, engaging, and educating visitors from different socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. They share a genuine desire to create a special gathering space for individuals from all walks of life to experience collections, films, and exhibitions. To build a museum like any, unlike any other that connects all people regardless of age, income, and language. And a deep belief that children no matter their skin color or zip code, deserve equal access to the arts. I've said it before and I'll say it again, there's no better home for the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art than an Expo Park. This park is already home to a variety of world-class museum and iconic institutions. The museum is near public transportation, with convenient freeway access, and in close proximity to dozens of K through 12 public uh, and charter schools and higher education institutions. Bottom line is, it's going to create jobs, increase tourism uh, and economic growth for the city, and it's going to add educational value. I think uh, we all agree uh, when we say, welcome home, Lucas Museum. Members, thank you for your time, and I respectfully ask uh, that, uh, one, we approve the general plan amendment to change the street designation a portion of 39th Street located between Vermont Avenue and Bill Robertson Avenue to a local street, and that uh, we request the city attorney to prepare and present an ordinance for the specific plan amendment to the Coliseum specific plan for council approval on June 27th. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Price. Mr. Mejia. Uh, in addition, Councilman, if we could approve the prior environmental actions uh, and re rely on them by the CPC and the advisory agency. Okay, we'll incorporate that into Mr. Price's motion. Well, first, I uh, want to thank um, everyone involved in bringing this here to um, potentially final approval after this committee onto full council. This is an incredible win for Los Angeles, uh, not only for Los Angeles, but the south, central, or the south and the central area of Los Angeles. And as we look at the ever-evolving downtown LA and the new downtown we have and the central part of Los Angeles re-emerging from decades of neglect, it's great to see that we are not only investing in more residences, more businesses, but also cultural institutions to add to that. And I think this is going to be a very important component as we reclaim uh, the area uh, for everyone. And so I want to thank everyone involved um, who was involved in this, the council office as well, incredible um, win for all of us and uh, it's not easy to put something together like this uh, finance it uh, move it through all the different agencies and whatever we have to do boards etc but uh, it's an incredible win so congratulations uh, anything else mr englander I had to say something this is this is this is huge um <laughs> this is exciting and uh by, by the way and, and just to correct the record there is no financing. Um, it's, <laughs> it's it's all on on uh, on Lucas. So, um, but to Mr. Price, it's got to come from someplace, right? <laughs> well, not from us. There's no no city financing. That's right. But, um, this is really exciting, and I wanted to thank. Uh, I know the whole Lucas team and uh, is here, and really appreciate you guys bringing this to Los Angeles and thanking uh, as well as the mayor and the mayor's office. But uh, to Mr. Price, my colleague. Uh, if there's any one thing that, you know, you can uh, plant a scene on in your district to walk away from and look, that's going to last for generations and uh, inspire so many and, and add so much culture and art uh, and opportunity to Los Angeles. You've, you've certainly done it here, and I congratulate you. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, so with that, we'll move the item per Price's uh, motion and with the additional uh, recommendations by Mr. Mejia, we'll incorporate that into the motion. Any objections to that? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. 
Okay, now we will take item number nine and 10 together. If we could read those into the record, please, Mr. Mejia. Sure, um, item nine, Councilman, there's five appeals on file. This relates to the track map appeal. Uh, it's for a 34 lot subdivision in CD12. It includes one lot uh, for open space and item 10, which is interrelated, relates to the zone change and that and two appeals that were also submitted for the record. Okay. One moment. Um, you know what? Let's do this. We have item, let's hold items 9 and 10. We have item 6 that just has one card, and we could dispose of that now because the other, this one has a number of cards. So if you call item 6 to, uh, to order, please. Man is a city attorney ordinance to establish the reef uh, sign district in Mr. Price's district. Thank you. Uh, we don't need a presentation from staff. We have um, heard this before, I think, but uh, the applicant's representative has uh, put in a card. You wish to speak? Edgar, Edgar Kal Kalashian. Thank you. Welcome. Edgar Kalashian with Mayor Brown. Uh, happy to keep a very brief councilman. Uh, we submitted a record, into, uh, a letter into the record uh, this past Thursday that I believe is in front of all of you uh, with the proposed amendments. We would support uh, the adoption of the sign district. Thanks. Happy There's to been answer any questions. Yeah, thank you. There's been some proposed amendments submitted by Mr. Price, I believe, and circulated. Um, so, Mr. Yes. Price. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, again. Um, as you recall, there were a number of community benefits in the development agreement uh, with the Reef that are going to provide job training and community programming to the local community. These benefits have been specifically tied to the sign district that's been approved for the project. In order to get these benefits flowing as quickly as possible, in the community. I'm requesting the following amendments. Section 4, to include a definition of super graphic signs. Section 6, to add a new subsection allowing director sign off for permit applications on any approved sign in the, in the sign district. Any sign that is generally consistent with the conceptual sign drawings in the approved and attached in appendices B and C of the sign ordinance. Section 8, amend the ordinance to delete super graphics from the list of prohibited signs and add it to the list of allowed signs. And section nine, to amend the ordinance to allow super graphic signs as shown in the conceptual sign drawings in appendices B and C. Members, these requested amendments are consistent with the letter that was submitted into the record on June 15th and which has been provided to you today. These amendments are also consistent with other signed districts that have been recently approved by the council. And I appreciate your, uh, your approval uh, Thank you very today much. on this item. Mm -hmm. So we will uh, move this item with the uh, proposed amendments uh, by Mr. Price. Mr. Mejia? Uh, so given Mr. Price's amendments, uh, city attorney will make those amendments and will hold the item in committee. Okay. Because the city attorney has to yes. make the amendments and then come back. Yes. Okay. We'll do that. We'll direct the city attorney to make those amendments and come back. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair? Yes. Are we, so are we continuing this item? Pardon me? Are we continuing this item? We're continuing this item. Thank you. Uh, well, no uh, specific date. We'll just continue it. All right. Um, continue the item. Items number 9 and 10. We read that into the record. We could call that to order. Item 9 and 10 uh, were the appeals. There's five appeals on item 9, which relates to the track map. <clears throat> this is a subdivision project, 34 lots and one lot for open space. And item 10 is the zone change related to the project with two appeals on file. Okay, is staff here to present on this, these two items, please? Welcome. Good afternoon, my name is Milena Zasagian with the Department of City Planning. I'm here to present on the Andorra subdivision project. This is a proposed project for a 34 lot subdivision on a 91 undeveloped site in the hills of Chatsworth. This proposes 33 single family homes and one open space lot. The 
single family homes will be clustered on the eastern portion of the site, leaving the open space lot for a total of about 63 acres to be donated as a conservation easement to the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority. The remaining portion of the site will be developed, uh, about 14 acres will be developed for the homes, and then the rear portions of these single foam single family home lots will also be placed into a conservation easement totaling about an additional 14 acres. The project involves a horse keeping district and each lot has been designed and conditioned to be able to accommodate horse keeping. Also includes public trails for hiking and equestrian tr for hiking and equestrians as well as a horse watering station. The City Planning Commission considered this project as well as a first level of track map appeals the zone change, the horse keeping district, and retaining wall deviations and approve the project. They found that the project strikes a balance by allowing for a reasonable development of private property through cluster development on the flat portions of the site, but also providing public benefits through the permanent conservation of over 70% of the site, as well as horse keeping amenities. Following the commission decision, there were five appeals filed on the tract and two appeals filed on the retaining wall decision. Most of the Comments of the appeals focus on the environmental issues such as wildlife and biological impacts, neighborhood compatibility, and fire safety. These are addressed in detail in the staff reports that were submitted to the council file. In general, through the conservation easement and consultation with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, we found that an appro appropriate wildlife corridor will be maintained on the site and impacts to biological resources will be minimized. The size and configuration of the lots will be consistent with the community character. And the fire department has determined that with the proposed secondary access road to the site that there will not be impacts in terms of fire and safety. However, um, based on the issues brought up in the appeals, we recommend certain clarifications and changes to some of the project design features and mitigation measures. These are also outlined in the staff reports. These. Uh, mostly have to do with clarifying the language to reflect the conservation easement agreement with the MRCA uh, to require adequate water supply to the Oak Grove on Andorra Avenue and based on feedback with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to add additional guidance on bat roosting mitigation, sensitive plant, plant restoration and to extend oak tree monitoring. Uh, therefore we recommend that you uh, deny in part and approve in part the appeals filed um, to allow some of these clarifications just mentioned and to approve the project. We'll uh, now go to um, public comment and then we'll come back to um, committee member discussion. The first is uh, Tina Takata, who is the co-appellant, along with Dina Fisher. Both of you together have five minutes. Tina Takata and Dina Fisher, co-appellants. Co Welcome. Hello. Hello. So, yes, I am Tina Takata. I am a, a resident adjacent to the property. Um, I have encouraged... Um, that development be nearer to my house than away from it because it has less impact on the wildlife corridor. But I have ongoing concerns about the very significant grading on this project. Um, for the 33 homes, uh, they have approximately 360,000 cubic yards of material. And we have a scenic plan, a specific plan in this area that is, um, this project is subject to, and it states that there shall be minimum grading okay. on this project. And in fact, it's not even just minimum grading, it's absolute minimum grading. And when you go to planning and speak to the planner that's responsible for this plan, he says you read it as it says, and you follow what it says. So I don't understand how, given the scenic plan, given the rugged, and very treasured nature of the topography in Western Chatsworth that a grading amount of this size would be allowed. Um, the community plan also points out that there needs to be linkage between the Santa Monica Mountains and the Santa Susana Pass to the north. And this project has significantly cut it. 
I provided you with a handout um, because the um, the packets that we got were the the photograph the photography was so muddy it was basically um, you couldn't make anything out in, in in this front picture the project is down here they say that the wildlife corridor goes up through the northwest portion and that is 1300 feet in that area 700 feet is between these two bl blue lines which represent an unrelated 7000 square foot house and his 700 feet of clearance it's really not a suitable wildlife corridor on the second picture in here, I've provided a uh, demonstration of what Google Maps shows for roadways, because if they went through that house, they would then run into a roadway and other houses immediately between, behind this, this wildlife corridor. And I've given you a larger graphic that shows um, a clear path. You can look at Google Maps and look at it in more detail, but you have a clear path from the nature preserve to the north. On the back, um, not in the back, the Zemus map. Um, part of the planning commentary in this round is that the northern part of the parcel only provides a 300 foot access point into the Santa Susana Pass Park. And that's true, but in the case of the northern part, there's 1,600 more feet that the adjacent Eagle's Nest property does provide. The problem with much of this analysis is that topography is never considered. The running the wildlife corridor through the Eagle's Nest property doesn't work. It doesn't work the way the trails are working now, and it's um, very inconsistent. Um, I'm concerned with the findings. The findings state that um, these uh, uh, K lots are to be approved even though you have less than 20,000 usable square feet on the K lots. CD12 has pretty much always said you have to have a 20,000 square foot lot so you can have horse keeping. If you can't use the lot, you don't have it available for horse keeping. And I don't understand why this precedent setting finding would just go through with no discussion and, and, and um, that associated with it. Um, I am um, very concerned as you, you, there's a discussion about CEQA and the wildlife corridor. Um, and it says that future projects should be considered. At some point in time, the Eagle's Nest parcel that they so blithely have driven their corridor through will be subject to a, to a um, you know, some sort of development action. It's a large parcel. The corridor is in the key flat portion of the parcel. That parcel has no um, restriction on fences, it has no restriction on future development. That wildlife corridor is totally ineffective when put through Eagle's Nest. It should go in a north-south direction. Um, I was concerned with timing. Um, oh, and last, my last picture, the retaining walls. The retaining wall nearest to my house seems to drive a hole so that the equestrian trail can be in a hole. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't seem to justify a retaining wall. Other retaining walls are behind pre-existing large rock outcrops populated by Santa Susana tar plant. And it's just not considered. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. You, you were Tina Takata, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, Dina Fisher, you're also part of... Um, the first appeal, so you have one minute because that five minutes have been taken up by your co-appellant. Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Thank Dina you. Fisher. I'm here to tell you that this project is going to decimate the wildlife corridor. The EIR egregiously misdescribed it. They ignored all of CDFW's definitions, stating that a minimum width for a wildlife corridor should be 1,000 feet. It lies and says that it's 1560. If you look at Exhibit A, it clearly shows that it will be reduced to 300 feet. Uh, another way, they also failed to take into account the negative impacts uh, down at Dayton Canyon, that it's concurrent development, also reducing the wildlife access to the corridor, to the nature preserve. And they falsely claim that there is a primary wildlife corridor, Exhibit B, please take a look. Once you apply CDFW's definitions, that corridor does not exist. So I'm going to ask you all to respect the community plan, which explicitly calls for protection of that corridor and the study of it. 
Thank you. Thank you. Appellant number two, uh, Dean Walroff. Welcome. Thank you. Um, how much time do I get? Five minutes. Oh, thank you. Um, former council members, thank you for taking the time to hear this appeal. Um, this project is the worst kind of sprawl. It's 33 houses on really expensive houses on 91 acres out at the edge of the city in what is now open space right next to the Chatsworth Nature Preserve. Um, we should be building infill instead, not sprawling the city out like this with low density, um, high environmental impact construction. Um, kind of realize that the city's planning system, everybody knows it's sort of broken, but um, that doesn't mean we should be approving all these projects that don't deserve to be approved. The notice system is also a little bit broken. Apparently this um, item is set for city council tomorrow, but none of the appellants received any kind of notice of that. I, I noticed it myself looking at the council file for this hearing. The, um, so there are two, two issues I want to talk about in my bit of time here. One is special status plants on the site, and the other is the, uh, the zoning scheme. And I, I'll do the zoning scheme first. The, it's, it's outrageous that the city is allowing uh, a, a whole bunch of grading on this site as, an agri as it's zoned for agriculture. Um, when it's really going to be subject to the baseline hillside ordinance when it gets approved. It's sort of a little shuffle. Um, I'm not, I won't concede that it's technically legal. I haven't really kind of gotten to that point yet. But the, the idea is let them do all their grading because the base, baseline hillside ordinance doesn't apply to agriculture, uh, agriculturally zoned land like this is now. And then at once they've done all this grading for retaining walls, as, as Tina Takata pointed out, it's a huge amount of grading. Then you rezone it for residential where the baseline hillside ordinance applies and where they could never do that much grading, and then you start building the houses. That, that's not really the right way to do the, the planning and the zoning. Special status plants. There are two um, special status plants, meaning threatened or endangered or listed somewhere on, on the property. One is the Santa Susana tar plant and the other is the plumber's mariposa lily. The, the lily was not analyzed in the CEQA documentation. The, it, it was found in the surveys, but there's no, because there were no mitigation measures originally on that plant, it, it, there was no finding that impacts on that plant would be not significant. And now in the staff report, the conditions of approval have been modified to require some essentially mitigation for effects on the plumber's mariposa lily. But uh, there's, there's no, as I say, there's no analysis under, under the CEQA, which there should be. Um, there's the, the mitigation for it is an implicit acknowledgement that there may be significant environmental effects from the project's you know, harm to that plant. So that violates CEQA. And then the other violation is the deferred and uncertain mitigation. There's a, to be developed in the future, a plan to um, transplant these plants and try to preserve them. But we don't have details of that plan right now. Mitigation is permitted under CEQA when there when it can't be figured out right now. So if, if there's some mitigation you need where you know you're gonna need it, but you, you for some reason can't do a plan, it's infeasible to do a plan now, you can defer that provided there's a standard against which the plan when it is finally developed will be measured. And we have neither of those things in this case. There's no evidence that the plan for the um, plumber's mariposa lily couldn't for, for like, mitigating the harm to it couldn't have been developed in connection with the EIR and included along with the EIR. And there's also no standard against which the, um, the, the mitigation will be measured. And it's, th these kinds of plants are really difficult to deal with because they kind of hide 
underground for long periods of time and pop up when the conditions are favorable for them. But what that means is surveys miss them. You, you go out one year, you see a you know, certain number. You go out the second year, you see diff a certain number in different places. And the fact that this California Native Plant Society survey found different plants in different places just proves Thank that. You. Thank you. Thank you. Our next appellant, Julie Clark de Blasio. Welcome. I'm Julie Clark de Blasio. I am the conservation chair with California Native Plants Society. We've been involved on this parcel since the, uh, before the current owner owned it. We were working with the former owner and California State Parks and an adjacent parcel to incorporate the parcel as part of the tangential State Historic Park, which is Santa Susana Mountain State Historic Park. Um, before I, I go into my arguments, I would like to register a complaint based on something that was vocalized. We are an appellant, and it, we, as, as Dean Walraff just said, we weren't noticed about a hearing tomorrow, as well as uh, we should have known, we should have been noticed about um, the oak tree monitoring the water provisions to the oak trees, monitoring and mitigation requirements that were recently discussed and agreed to with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. As an appellant, those were topics that we had addressed and the public record will show that we've been involved in this development since the scoping period. So um, I, I I, these are points that we were going to address today, and I'm altering my argument. Um, but first and foremost, going on, this project is, is contradictory to several city uh, initiatives, plans, and endorsements. Um, it is, it, it, our, our, one of our scientists recently calculated and found that the habitat removal um, that's stated in the EIR is incorrect because it doesn't account for habitat removal that's part of city fire code, which is a 200-foot sphere around each home, which effectively doubles the amount of habitat and native plants that are removed. Right now, it stands in the EIR at 30%. It will go up to about 60% once the residences are there. Um, we also question the biological surveys that were done. Um, first and foremost, they contradict our rare plant survey for the Santa Susana tar plant, uh, and they found 50% uh, less of the tar plant, which is a perennial species, so it grows year-round. It comes back every year, and that's a, that's a huge contradiction in that we found close to 500 plants, and the biological uh, consultant found about half of that. Um, the plumber's mariposa lily was also discussed. We also found that their surveys were done in drought years and late season, and, and we conducted a survey last year, which was still a drought year, and were able to increase the biological uh, the plant list by over 30%. So we're questioning, the, we're questioning the biological surveys and think they need to be revisited. Um, we would like to know more about monitoring and mitigation. Um, you'll see in packets, we've given you our, uh, our biological report that was done in conjunction with the DEIR. We gave you our letter with the final EIR, and we gave you a report for rare plant surveys for the tar plant that were done in 2004 by the prior owner's biological consultants, which corroborate with our findings. They found close to 500 plants as well. This is a plant that is by California Department of Fish and Wildlife. It is a rare plant. So it's, it's a significant plant that this, that 
that falls mostly out of the proposed conservation easement through MRCA. It will be impacted by horses, animals, foot traffic, and any other kind of anthropogenic activity. So we'd also like to address the, the water quality issues and the, the proposed water retention system on the project. It, it, we believe it violates the, uh, the Porter Cologne Water Quality Act of California and a federal consent decree for total maximum daily loads uh, for the Los Angeles River that are designed to pre prevent ac nutrient and bacteria from getting into the river. Thank you. Thank you. Our next appellant, David Ramey. Good afternoon. My name is David Ramey. I am a doctor of veterinary medicine who has practiced in the Los Angeles area since 1984. And my practice is limited to the care and treatment of horses. I live in Andorra Estates, and w along with a few o others, my life will be more severely impacted by this development than anyone else. I live across the street from the property. So I'd like to thank you uh, for allowing me the opportunity to raise a couple of uh, concerns. Now, this, this proper, this development does cost, call for massive land development, and it one, it's one that asks you to ignore a lot of existing regulations. And I don't understand why. I mean, apparently, this is a project that is designed for the benefit of a few against the wishes of many, virtually everyone that lives in the area. This, pro this project was initially, uh, initially projected as uh, what's called a false dilemma in logic. The developer proposed a terrible development, a really bad development of 44 homes, and then secondarily pro uh, proposed a development that was just sort of terrible with 33 homes. My question is, why is all of this necessary? Why, why cannot the developer propose something that is in accordance with current existing land management regulations. Why do we need to issue all of these waivers, destroy all of this land, impact all of this wildlife? It, it doesn't seem to make any sense. That being said, I'd like to raise two additional points. First of all, first of all what about my rights as an individual? I'm, I'll be 61 years old this year. I've lived in this, prop, in this area for 20 years. I've watched my property values increase, and like many Americans, the majority of my retirement is laid up in the equity in the home. If this development proceeds, what happens to that? Where is the mitigation for my rights? We talk about the, the mitigation for uh, various things, but what about my rights? I asked the developer. He said, well, your property is going to go up in value. I said, well, why don't you buy my property then? Because obviously if it goes up, you could then get an increase in value, but I was laughed at. So there, what about the rights of individuals? There's, no in, there's nothing coming from the developer about mitigating the damage to me and to my rights. My second point, though, involves the equestrian development. Now, this, you cannot allow this to pass like this. I mentioned that I'm a doctor of veterinary medicine and I specialize in horses, and you'd think I'd be excited to have a whole bunch of new clients right next door. But I'm also an expert in equine disaster management and equine welfare. I've taught equine disaster management at the University of California, Davis. I've taught equine welfare and management to Los Angeles County animal welfare personnel, to Riverside County animal welfare personnel. Last year, I assisted Los Angeles County in the sand fires and the Sand Canyon fire and the Calabasas fire. I had to put a horse to sleep in the canyon fire. I watched barns burn. We live in a high fire area. I lived in this area in 2005 and we couldn't get out. This, we couldn't get out because of the egress. And what is proposed in the egress here is a narrow road down a steep grade. There's no way that a horse trailer and a fire truck can pass on this grade. If you park a fire truck on this grade to battle the resident, to battle the fires, we had the fires in 2005 and we could not get out. 
So you want to put a steep egress down that won't allow a horse trailer, which is 10 feet wide, and a fire truck that's 10 feet wide to pass. You want to park a fire truck in the middle of this road so that nobody can pass using this egress. And what about horses require combustible materials? They require hay. They require bedding, and you want to bring these combustible materials into a land that is, uh, that, is higher, that is high fire danger. You're putting lives at risk if you, oppose, if you propose this for horses. Where's the fire plan for this development? Where is it? Who created it? What equine experts were consulted? Is there a plan to insert the fire protection of the boundaries that come in? Is there, has it been, has it been cited by, by experts at Davis or anyone else at, in disaster management? The answer is no. Where's the documentation showing what's going to happen to these horses? How are they going to move from the area? Where are they going to go if there is a fire? It's on a hill. Fires roll up hills. This is dangerous. It is, it is unreasonable, and it has to be considered for the safety of everyone in the area. Thank you. Okay, now we'll turn to the applicants. Uh, Brad Rosenheim is the representative, and Bill McReynolds. Would you take the full five minutes, or are you going to split those? With I the will try to keep it as short as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, my name is Brad Rosenheim, 21600 Oxnard Street. I'm here today on behalf of Andorra Properties, LLC. I'd like to thank the staff. They did a very... Um, detailed and thorough report on this project. As you can see, there were many concerns raised by the community, and they did a tremendous job of responding to those concerns. This is a project that is consistent with the Chatsworth Porter Ranch community plan. It is a project that implements the zoning pattern called out for in that plan. It's a project that has evolved over many years of meeting with the community. We had at least 16 meetings with the community, as well as individual meetings with neighbors and other interested parties. We do have the Chatsworth Neighborhood Council support as a result. The project has been reduced in scale over those meetings by 21% in terms of the number of homes and increased the, the amount of open space by 15%. It is a clustered development which is called out for in the community plan. By doing so, we are able to preserve 63 acres and reserve another 13.74 acres, 77 acres in total, in conservation easement dedicated to the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority, a very significant give of the 91 acres. In so doing, and in so preserving this area, we have preserved a tremendous number of rock outcroppings, by far the preponderance of rock croppings in the area. Sensitive plants which, which were mentioned. Oak trees. We provide public accessibility for hiking and equestrians, trying to balance the demands for preserving open space but also allowing access for the public. We have worked diligently with the fire department. They have analyzed the access and the secondary access, and they have supported and approved the plans that we have submitted to them. We have preserved 1,560 foot wide conservation wildlife easement and corridor. Now this corridor, by comparison, relative to the 200 or so foot corridor that is proposed, wildlife corridor proposed over the Ventura Freeway, far exceeds that, so it's clearly a good wildlife corridor for the uh, wildlife in the area. Um, there has been an exhaustive environmental analysis performed by the city. There have been uh, additional analysis at the request uh, of the um, interested parties for wildlife and for um, plant studies. Those have been performed. The responses to the comments have been numerous. Um, we have, again, this property could accommodate 36 homes if we did nothing other than graded the entire 91 acres and preserved nothing. This is a great project for the community. It preserves 77 acres for the broader community to utilize. We very much appreciate 
the staff's work on this and we respectfully request your support for the vesting tentative track map, the EIR, and the zone change and the zoning administrator determination. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bill McReynolds. Speaking, uh, Bill McReynolds uh, with Andorra Properties uh, One LLC. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, council and staff for their time regarding this. I did bring in uh, six letters uh, that we received of community support uh, from residents in the neighboring Chadsworth Lake Manor area, uh, business leaders, and uh, other individuals that are very concerned uh, about seeing this development move forward uh, for So we're very pleased to have been working with the community uh, throughout this entire process. It's been a three and a half year process. Uh, as Mr. Uh, as Brad mentioned, we did receive uh, the Chatsworth Neighborhood Council's support of the development, and we're excited to be here and moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. James Van Gundy, Rhonda Benson, Jane Stanton, Jim Van Gundy, um, I'm a neighbor. I live on Andorra Avenue, Roy Rogers Estates. Um, safety is first and foremost in my mind. The basic hillside ordinance plan written for the safety of residential property. However, the developer has made a round, uh, end around by attempting to have retaining walls uh, approved at a higher height than what would be approved if it were residential prior to the zoning change to residential. If it's safety, that's, that's the requirement for the 10 foot retaining walls as residential, then they should apply to this particular development. Second, fire at egress. As pointed out, Plummer Street is extremely steep when it gets to this gentleman's property who's uh, given the, just wait a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Rhonda Benson, Jane Stanton, Sarah Golden. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Rhonda Benson, and as a licensed real estate agent and resident of the San Fernando Valley, I'm here today to encourage you to approve this project. Um, as we are all aware, our city is in desperate near need of creating housing um, increasing housing for the demand of new residents in the Chatsworth area. The Andorra project is a perfect fit that I believe creates a balance between preserving the natural beauty of Chatsworth and developing homes in a safe and responsible manner. As an agent, one of the reasons many of my clients ask to look, for, look at homes in the Chatsworth area is due to the mix between urban and open space. The developer in the project has done a fine job fitting the project with the balance of the two. This project will have very little grading, keeping most of the natural hills, Chatsworth hillside, and not require any soil transportation. The Andorra project will add, add 33 homes to our Chatsworth community, making strides toward filling the gap in the housing and housing in our area. Good developers like DB Builders, who put forth projects, create new homes while uh, preserving, sorry, <laughs> space. Great, thank you. Sorry. Jane Stanton, Sarah Golden, Christine Rangel. Hello, I'm Jane Stanton, and I'm the director of the YMCA in the area. I do support the addition to the, this uh, project to the community. I want to thank the developer for working with the community on making this a project that is supported by the community. I also want to thank him for being very active as a donor and a, uh, to the community in many different groups, including our YMCA. And I also look forward to working with their staff in making this a good project. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Golden. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Golden with VICA, the Valley Industry Commerce Association. VICA is proud to support the development of the Andorra subdivision. This project will have a positive economic impact on Los Angeles, creating local jobs, income and revenue for local government. There is a need for a broad range of housing types in the San Fernando Valley. This type of housing being proposed at the community will be attractive to entrepreneurs and business owners which will assist in keeping businesses in the San Fernando Valley and Los Angeles. 
This project has put the safety of the community at the forefront and will add an emergency access road from Andorra Avenue to Plummer Street, which will increase the overall safety of the Chatsworth community and the Roy Rogers Estates neighborhood. The road is being added for the benefit of the Chatsworth community and the Roy Rogers Estates neighborhood at no cost to the community or neighborhood. The donation of 66.8 acres of land plus $15,000 to the Mountain Mountains Recreation Conservancy Agency represents a significant financial commitment by the developer to the residents of the City of Los Angeles. Vika is proud to support this project. Thank you. Thank you. Christine Rangel. Good afternoon. Christine Rangel, uh, Building Industry Association. On behalf of the BIA, I would like to express our support of the approval of 9503 North Andorra Place. The economic benefits include quality jobs, government revenue, and economic stimulus. It is anticipated that in year one, the project will create several million dollars in local income, taxes, and other revenue to local governments, 130 local jobs, and then continue to provide all these things year after year. It features protected open space property. We all know that there's a housing crisis in the city of LA, and this is due to a housing shortage. Home prices continue to appreciate. The combination of population growth and limited supply will continue to complicate the challenge of housing accessibility and affordability for the city and the region. The approval of this project would further ensure housing opportunity for residents in LA. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Englander? No, thank you very much. And um, I want to thank all those who came forward uh, today. This, is, this is project has been going on for. Mr. Herman, you're going to wave your hands again and disrupt the people behind you. I think the chair is going to ask you to leave. So I know you were warned earlier by, uh, by the chair as well. Yes, uh, Herman, um, we've been advised numerous times at this meeting about how you are bothering other people here by your waving of the hands unnecessarily. And so if you do that again, we're going to have to ask you to leave. Thank you very much. Oh, now you're disrupting Thank the you. meeting. All right. So, um, so this project's been going on for, for a long time, uh, <laughs> far before, uh, before I got here. It's had a long history of entitlements, approvals, proposals. Um, and, uh, and in fact, at one time, I think uh, there was uh, approximately 50 homes for approval at this site. Um, and looking at that, I, I think there were some statements made earlier by some of the supporters um, alluding to the fact that we have a housing shortage, which is by far uh, an understatement. I, I don't think this project helps solve that. <laughs> we're looking at, um, you know, at best 3,300 homes. I don't, I don't think that's going to make a dent in our 100,000 shortage. But um, having said that, some of the folks had uh, mentioned earlier the wildlife corridor issues, and I know the, the applicant addressed that. Uh, the biological surveys as it pertains to CEQA, um, and so I want to ask planning staff a couple things. One, um, since we certify the EIRs, was the biological surveys appropriate as it relates to CEQA, the water retention issues, and then also a um, big part of that, and I think uh, two of the three appellants brought up the fire department issue, the fire access issues for the ingress and egress. So I want that addressed. Did the fire department actually review and uh, approve this project as planned? And so if you could speak to those items. Thank you. Well, Lena Sasajo in the Department of City Planning. So uh, in terms of the biological impacts, we have had a number of surveys conducted over the years on the property. Um, since plants are always a constantly changing biological resource, there have been different variations in the number of plants counted, and, um, but they basically stayed in similar locations. So as part of regulatory compliance, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is going to require an updated survey prior to any grading activities. So that way we have the most updated information before any grading starts so we can protect the species that are okay. located or might be impacted. Um, uh, Water retention issues were analyzed, so there was a hydrological study about where the water flow is going to be um, coming down into the subdivision, and so there's been a catchment basin part of the project in order to uh, 
catch some of that water. And as part of the appeals, uh, people did bring up issues of the Oak Grove along Andorra Avenue getting the appropriate amount of water. So the we've included a new um, project design features that says that when we do design the, the stormwater system for the area as part of the city process that uh, will ensure that th that Oak Grove retains the same amount of water for the preservation of the oak trees. We've also been consulting with the fire department, so they have uh, reviewed conceptual plans for the, the secondary access road, which goes through the private property to the south through an easement. The, the subdivision will have a main entrance from Andorra Avenue, and that's at least 30 feet wide at a minimum um, to allow for the safe passage of ingress and egress of vehicles. The secondary access road is really meant for fire department use, so in case um, the fire department can access that subdivision from this rear portion, but it's not meant for regular use of vehicles or regular use of horse trailers. It's really meant for fire department use in emergencies. And um, it was also mentioned that um, we're going to have some lots that aren't necessarily um, equine or K overlays. And um, my understanding is each one of these lots would be a minimum of 20,000 feet. Yeah, um, I don't have the... I think they're all at least a minimum 17,500, but most of them are 20,000 or more. Uh, well, at 17,500 is the minimum. Yes, so it so What's the smallest lot size at this, on the 33 homes? Um, 17,500 is the smallest? 17,500, okay. um, and it conforms to all the standards for the K district, which right. give e even more permission to be able to have flexibility in your horse keeping standards. So with the K overlay and having a designated K district on this, there's going to be required setbacks mm -hmm. uh, from neighbors and, and um, direct access points from the front yard to the rear yard for horse keeping that have to be protected and maintained in perpetuity. Is that correct? That's correct. There's also, um, they're required to identify uh, 2, 000, a minimum 2,000 square foot uh, flat graded area for the potential for horse keeping horse keeping on that area and a direct access path to that horse keeping well, One of the area. statements was that this is precedent setting. Do we have other areas in Chatsworth that are, we have K overlays throughout the city that are 17.5? Yes, those are, that's the minimum standard and a lot of the standard conditions here are just same standard conditions that we put on other subdivisions in Chatsworth. Okay. Um, and uh, my, okay, I appreciate it. I think that's the questions I wanted to make sure all those points that were brought up by all the appellants and the neighbors that were concerned were asked and answered. Um, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I do have a question to the city attorney. Um, it was stated earlier that there wasn't proper notification for the city council meeting, the full city council meeting tomorrow to the appellants on this. And that's the first time I've ever heard anybody suggest that unless some people have brought that up in the past on special agendas, but this is a regular agenda item for tomorrow. So if you could address that. Terry Coughlin, Messias City Attorney's Office. The, the public hearing is today, and this is the hearing that was noticed. Tomorrow is, um, you just need Brown Act notice, the 72-hour the agenda. So it's not a, a public hearing tomorrow. Today's the public hearing for this item. And this item was properly agendized. I know it was moved from uh, last week as well. Right, um, but the issue wasn't the, for for this hearing, it's not the agenda, it's the notice, and it, w it was noticed for, for today, correct? Thank you very so. much. Colleagues, uh, I don't know if you uh, were paying close attention to this, but this is a 91-acre area um, with heavy density of 33, no, I'm not going to be sarcastic, it's 33 homes. I know some of my colleagues have looked at me and saying, you have 91 acres where? Um, we have a lot more than that. We like it that way. Um, we like open space and uh, preservation and horse keeping and our rural way of life. Uh, and I will tell you right now, because of those protections, one of the toughest neighborhood councils by far in the city to get anything approved at all, moving a rock or a stone, is Chatsworth. Um, and, uh, and I applaud their efforts. Um, I wanted to ask uh, the applicant, do you have any, have you been, uh, you don't have to come up, but you just share it. Um, have you been to the uh, Chatsworth Neighborhood Council more than one time on this item, including their planning and land use management? Have you been more than five times? More than 10 times? More than, okay. Um, I, let me tell you, and over, over six months, a year, two years, three years? So uh, this isn't one that comes easy. Um, it's a grind to work with this community to make sure that all of those equestrian 
and open space protections are put in place. Uh, and you know, I want to thank everybody that's been involved in this, quite frankly, because because of that, uh, not only 70% of the site of 91 acres is being dedicated to uh, with a conservation easement, and that's protected in perpetuity, can never be touched, but there's an additional 14 acres now that have been added to that easement as well, uh, with an equestrian overlay and amenities that, um, that fit the overlay, so you don't just have sort of an equestrian community built with no horses. Um, you've got those amenities and um, watering troughs and things that go along with it, so uh, I think they've gone a long way to, to make sure that those issues in the area of and the characteristics of this neighborhood are maintained. And I want to thank everybody at the neighborhood council uh, and the community that negotiated those points with the applicant to protect this area. Uh, so then I would ask then that we deny the appeals in part though, but we grant in part by incorporating clarifying language to the conditions and recommendations that were set forth in the planning June 8th and June 16th reports. And these are mostly on their conservation easement language as suggested earlier in the presentation by the planning department. Uh, and I would ask for your I vote on those. Okay. Been motioned by Ms. England or seconded by Harris Dawson. Any questions or comments? Mr. Mejia, are you okay? Uh, yes, so it's for both items 9 and 10. Either it's for both 9 and 10. Okay, so without objection, uh, Mr. Englander's motion carries. Thank you very much. Item number 11. Sure. Uh, item 11, Councilman, this is an appeal uh, filed by the Sunset Coalition, Brentwood residents in CD11. It has to do with a haul route um, to export 80,632 cubic yards of earth for a new multi-purpose facility with underground parking for an existing school in CD11. Thank you. If staff could provide us a brief overview, please. Good afternoon. Cora Johnson, Board Secretary for the Building and Safety Commission. A public hearing was held on May 16th. Uh, the board approved the hall route and accepted the EIR. And the route uh, basically consists of Sunset Boulevard and goes right to the 405 freeway. Um, also approved at that hearing were bottom dump trucks uh, recommended by Department of Transportation and approved by the board. And I know one of the appeal items was that they requested a smaller haul truck, but the bottom dump trucks will take approximately 300 hauling days. If you reduce that size to the 10 wheel dump trucks, it'll probably increase the days to about 450. I'm available for any other okay. questions. Thank you. We'll go to the uh, appellant, Douglas Karstens. Uh, my name is Tom Stemnock, and I'm representing Mr. Goldstein. Uh, yeah, we haven't. Who are you representing? Mr. Goldstein, the appellant. The appellant? Yes. Oh, and Mr. Karstens, you representing who? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the other hall route. Yeah, you're on the um, 12, right? right? Yes, you're on 12. Thank you. There was some mix-up with the agendas, correct? And so we're, we're it's, it's not on you. I think uh, several people were confused today as to what items were up at what time because the, the initial agenda had some misinformation on it. So, okay. Welcome. Thank you, and good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Nice to see you again, and honorable uh, committee members. Uh, Honorable City Attorney, staff, uh, Council District 11. My name is uh, Douglas Karstens for uh, Chatton, Brown and Karstens. We're here on behalf of the Sunset Coalition, the Brentwood Residents Coalition, the Brentwood Hills Homeowners Association. We submitted a letter uh, earlier. I'd like to just give highlights of that in the uh, five minutes or so. Um, we're asking for, and we need to see a subsequent environmental impact report uh, prior to uh, hall route approval uh, because there uh, is a need for additional analysis and mitigation on the updated uh, impacts that will occur under this uh, hall route proposal. 
The applicant, the Archer School, has intensified the construction traffic and activity by compressing the schedule from a 74 months originally proposed to 36 months, which was proposed and approved after the final EIR during the review process back in 2015. The EIR has already identified as significant uh, construction traffic impacts on Sunset's intersections with the Barrington and Barrington Place and Church Lane. Uh, so there are already identified significant construction impacts. Uh, we'd like to see mitigation limits on the number of trucks per hour and on the use of the residential roads, Chaparral and Barrington. Uh, we'd like to see mitigation measures, including on the types of trucks that would be used, um, but instead mitigation measures are being removed. 32C in the conditional use permit, no right turn on red is being uh, abandoned. Chaparral widening is being abandoned. Air quality impacts from this uh, construction traffic will be intensified. The Environmental Audit Inc. Uh, letter that we have attached to our letter identifies uh, calculations that were done wrongly or on the basis of scientifically outdated information. This was analysis done in 2015 that used data from uh, 2003. It's now 2017. It is high time to update that with uh, scientifically current breathing rates. The breathing rates were, that were used in the EIR are for adults. They're not for children. Uh, they're for adults, and we don't understand why they did not use uh, the children's breathing rates. This is a school. This is near apartments with children, with infants, uh, so children will be impacted by this. Uh, they did not apply uh, age sensitivity factors that are factors that are applied to children and the elderly. There are numerous elderly as well as children in the apartments like 125 Barrington. Uh, perhaps recognizing the outdated analysis in 2015, the city required what's called Project Design Feature B2. Project Design Feature B2 required an updated health risk assessment prior to the use of heavy duty construction equipment. It did not say prior to the permits, it said prior to the use of construction equipment. That has not been done, uh, but the construction equipment uh, has started rolling and therefore we are asking that prior uh, to any further work, uh, project design feature B2 be implemented with an updated HRA. And uh, PDF B2 recommended a number of mitigation measures. Mitigation measures including uh, new or 2010 or newer construction equipment, use of filters, use of EPA tier four emission equipment, alternative fuels on site. We're asking that those mitigation measures be required we wonder why is it that they're not required? Why is the public not as protected to the extent possible that they could? So uh, in addition to these impacts, uh, we are asking for uh, cumulative impact analysis. It is two years after the 2015 approval. There has been an approval of the Brentwood School nearby. The West Campus trucks from that project will use Sunset. There has been an approval of 11600 West Dunstan Way at 33,000 cubic yards of uh, material moving on Barrington. That's a major impact. There's a proposal for the Mount St. Mary's University to use the uh, haul routes along Sunset. That's the only way it can access the 405 freeway. Therefore, in conclusion, we're asking that you require a subsequent EIR prior to haul route approval. Uh, in fact, we are asking that you hold approval of the haul route until the litigation that is now ongoing regarding the EIR and the Los Angeles Municipal Code violations uh, by the city in approving the Archer project in the first place is resolved on appeal so we wouldn't have to come back and undo a further approval. With that, I appreciate the time. I will wrap up my remarks and I appreciate the attention. We'll stand by for any questions. Great. Thank you very much. Beth Gordy, applicant. Good afternoon, Chair Weezer and honorable committee members. I'm Beth Gordy with Latham and Watkins on behalf of the Archer School for Girls. In 2015, the city council unanimously approved the Archer Forward project. It was an extremely public and transparent process resulting in thousands of supporters voicing their desire for the city to approve the project and two opponents who had been most active in the process, the residential neighbors of Archer and the Brentwood Homeowners Association supporting Archer Forward. 
Last month, the Board of Building and Safety Commissioners unanimous, unanimously approved the Archer Forward Hall Route. The Hall Route, including the number of trucks, the route itself, the days and the hours, is the exact same Hall Route that was analyzed in the Archer Forward CUP and EIR. The small group of opponents who now appeal the Hall Route have also challenged the Archer Forward approvals and have lost at every juncture. The majority of the arguments in this appeal were raised during the administrative proceedings on this project before the city and rejected. These opponents have made the same arguments now twice before the Los Angeles Superior Court, where their arguments have been rejected again each time. As detailed in our submittal letter, the opponents' claims are inaccurate and lack merit. There are no changed circumstances or new information warranting additional environmental review. The construction truck traffic on the haul route was accurately disclosed and analyzed in the EIR. The EIR analyzed the amount of haul and the number of trucks and that is not increased. The EIR also analyzed cumulative traffic impacts from nearby projects that were known at the time of the NOP for the EIR, including the Brentwood School. The opponents continue to allege that the EIR should have used different OEHOG guidelines. The opponents raised this issue during the administrative process here at the city, and the city denied the appeal then and approved the project. The opponents have also twice raised these claims at the Superior Court and have lost both times. The city has the discretion to determine which threshold to use. This project will not result in significant air quality impacts to neighbors or the students at the school. Um, regarding project design feature B2, um, this hall route is for the Archer Forward Phase 1, and prior to the issuance of any building permits, including the grading permit for Phase 1, the city will evaluate the project's compliance with all conditions, project design features, and mitigation measures related to construction, including pro project design feature B2. Um, Chaparral and North Barrington will not be used as part of the Phase 1 hall route before you today. When, as to the phase two haul route, Archer will apply for a separate haul route approval at that time. Um, and regarding the construction schedule, the Superior Court has twice held that the EIR's analysis of the construction schedule was legally adequate. The opponent's concerns about overlapping activities are unfounded. Archer will not be increasing the activity during the excavation and haul. In fact, there have been no changes to the haul route as a result of the project's accelerated construction schedule. Um, there are also, as to public safety concerns, there are 10 mitigation measures in the EIR um, that address potential traffic and access issues during construction, including requ requiring that flaggers be used to control trucks moving in and out of the site, and the board's haul route approval imposes even more safety requirements, inclu including truck crossing warning signs and flag attendance with two-way radios. We ask that the committee recommend that the City Council deny the appeal and affirm the Board's approval of the Hall Route. Thank you. Thank you. Sophia Wright, and then Tricia Keene from Council District 11. Uh, Honorable Plum Committee, thank you for your time. My name is Sophia Wright, and I am a homeowner, and I live on Chaparral Street within 50 feet of Archer School Campus. I am here to support the appeal filed by Sunset Coalition. Archer has already started the so-called pre-construction activities and over the past two weeks I have personally witnessed heavy construction equipment and vehicles on site as well as pollution, dust in the air and dirt on Chaparral Street at the entrance to the construction site. As it's described in the appeal filed by Sunset Coalition and in its own communication from Archer School to the LADOT and, CB and DOE, Archer has failed to comply with its CUP condition to properly mitigate existing traffic on Chaparral Street, and now Archer School is making the problem worse by allowing heavy construction equipment and vehicles on Chaparral Street. I ask the committee to deny the approval of Hall Route and require Archer School and Planning Department to do a supplemental EIR in order to properly address all the issues outlined in the appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Trisha Keene from Council District 11. Good afternoon. Trisha Keene, Director of Land Use and Planning for Councilmember Mike Bonin. 
I'm here on behalf of the council member to support the Archer School for Girls application for a hall route. As you know, the project allowing for modernization of Archer's campus was previously approved by the city council. The request before you today is consistent with that approved project and is consistent with the goal of ensuring that any major hauling activity associated with the project is completed during the summer when area schools are not in regular session and that hauling stops prior to the afternoon peak hours. We believe the proposed application accomplishes these goals and therefore support the hall route as it was applied for. So I respectfully request that your committee deny the appeal and approve the hall route application as requested by the applicant and as approved by the Board of Building and Safety Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments? No. Okay. Well, we'll move to... Um, Deny the hall route appeal and sustain the determination of the Board of Building and Safety Commissioners. Second by Mr. Cedillo. Any objection to that? No objection, so ordered. Thank you. Item number 12. Item, item 12, Councilman, this is an appeal by James Goldstein. This is a hall route to export 4,096 cubic yards of earth for a three-level single-family home at 1240 North Angelo Drive in CD5. Welcome. Thank you again. Uh, Cora Johnson, Board of Building and Safety Commission, Board Secretary. Uh, we had a hearing held on May 16th. The haul route was approved with one condition that the haul trucks cannot uh, go in reverse up Angelo Drive. And we also approved the categorical exemption or it was accepted. Um, it was denied previously. They applied for a new haul route and the board approved the haul route again. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer. Who was the appellant of record on this? Okay, so you represent the appellant? Okay. Yes, I'm Tom Stemnock representing James Goals. Goldstein, the, the uh, appellant. Okay, welcome. Five minutes. Welcome. Let, let me give you these. Uh, for the record, I'm Tom Stemnock, Planning Associates, representing Mr. James Goldstein, who's the appellant uh, in this matter of a haul route approval. Uh, this is the second appeal on a haul route on this property. Uh, there was an appeal filed on the original haul route approval in January, which the city council granted the appeal, denied the haul route in March. Uh, council member Kretz requested that the applicant meet with us and the immediate neighbors uh, to listen to our concerns and address them before filing an application for a revised haul route. The applicant never contacted Mr. Goldstein nor his representatives nor the immediate neighbor, but instead refiled the exact same application 10 days later. <clears throat> the Building Safety Commission on, on May 16th again approved the haul route with the addition of a single requirement that no trucks would be allowed to back up or down uh, Angelo Drive, which is a very steep hillside street. Our concerns uh, are about the safety of first loading on the street under this haul route, they will begin by loading haul route trucks on the street, later backing trucks onto the site, and then having the trucks pull out of the site and somehow make a 180 degree turn uh, to leave the site uh, and go down Angelo Drive. Uh, the, the documents I passed you, the, the first page, the yellow page is Mr. Goldstein's property. It completely surrounds the applicant's property, which is the blue property. Uh, on three sides. Angelo Drive comes up from Benedict, Can from, uh, yeah, Benedict Canyon and adjoins the subject property uh, uh, at, the, at the northern edge of the street. Um, the photos show how steep the existing site is. They also show uh, how steep Angelo Drive is and they show that trucks leaving the site are not able to make a 180 degree turn onto Angelo Drive to exit it must somehow back off into Angelo Drive and make some kind of a, at least a three-point turn in order to leave the, the area. Uh, we're also concerned as to how the trucks could be brought onto the site uh, and turned around to leave the site. 
uh, once the trucks were, the grading had reached a certain point, the trucks are supposed to be on the site, loading is supposed to take uh, effect on the site, and the trucks are supposed to turn around and leave the site uh, going forward. Uh, Mr. Goldstein's greatest concern is that the proposed grading on the site will affect the stability of the exist existing steep slopes which support his property and the improvements on it. Mr. Goldstein made a promised gift of this property, uh, including the John Lautner designed house, uh, the accessory structures, and the surrounding hillside gardens to LACMA uh, with a trust to maintain the property in perpetuity and make it available to the city, or make it available to the citizens of the city after his passing. current grading plan is based on an addendum of soils and geology reports, five of which, which have been submitted to and approved by Building and Safety, which would have, which, but which have not been made available for public review. Building and Safety reviews these reports, writes approval letters, and then sends the reports to some company to be scanned and entered into the records. So they disappear and they're not available for review for four to six months. So we have not been able to review these reports. At this time, we have only seen a revised grading plan, which is based on the addendum reports, contains several modifications to the city's grading ordinances regarding the stability of the slopes with Mr. Goldstein's property. The proposed haul route includes conditions that are not realistic, uh, do not provide added protection to Mr. Goldstein or the adjacent neighbor's property, nor the immediate community. The haul route permit should be denied as was the previous permit and all the information concerning the revised design of the grading and slope stabilization on the property should be made available for review and comment before any haul route is permitted and any grading or building permits are issued. Uh, I can answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. Not at this time. Thank you. So Bruce Giuliani, the applicant. Good afternoon. I'm the owner of the project. I have my all staff, professional staff over here to discuss about this project. Since from five years ago we designed, architect here, and all my staff, they are professional to explain what's going on. And whatever the previous gentleman said about is not about the safety is about the race. Mr. Goldstein is against of the Persian people. I'm Persian. I'm living here for 40 years. And it's all about the race. He's against of my race. He told me true, true to my face. Thank you. Okay, so that ends the uh, appellant's five minutes. Now we'll go, or who are you, sir? Project manager, I actually was intended to speak initially to introduce the team and then Mr. Okay, go Giuliani. ahead. So we'll, we'll uh, give you all the, f we'll, we'll get, continue in the five minutes. Like go ahead. Alan Cade. Our time, okay. Okay. Um, again, Alan Cade representing Mr. Giuliani as a project owner. Uh, please keep in mind that this hearing. You could speak into the microphone, please. Thank you. Please keep in mind that this hearing is being held relative to the hall route. The hall route was approved for the second time by the Board of Building and Safety Commissioners on May 16th of this year. And again, a second appeal was filed. Uh, the amount of soil to be removed from the project location is a total of 4,096 cubic yards. The actual excavation amount is only 3,200 cubic yards. The difference is what's called the bulking factor, and that's the amount that the soil expands when it's loaded onto the trucks. So I don't know if you typically have just net or gross figures presented to you, but the 4,096 is a gross. That equates to approximately 410 truckloads, which over a hauling duration of 25 days is approximately 17 truckloads a day, which equates to between the 9 a.m. and 3 p.m hauling time, only about three truckloads per hour. So this is not a very significant uh, hauling situation. 
Uh, the design has continuously been reviewed by building and safety and modified as requested to meet the current more stringent codes. The haul route does not go past Mr. Goldstein's residence. The haul route does not go up and past the hairpin turn and up the steep hill, uh, both of which are further north on North Angelo Drive. The city attorney's office has reviewed the uh, documents submitted, the mitigated negative declaration request. The Department of Transportation and Bureau of Street Services have reviewed the haul route, and the actual haul route was as uh, directed by the Department of Transportation. They also established a potential street bond, a damage bond amount of $273,000. Uh, the project will develop an unsightly vacant parcel of land and add to the property tax base. We have had meetings at the Council District 5 office. Mr. Giuliani has written to the neighbors. I have personally called and emailed neighbors to address their concerns. Uh, there has been an invitation for Mr. Goldstein and his representative to attend those meetings. However, that was coordinated through Council Dis District 5 office and they never were present. Uh, from a safety standpoint, although the details will be addressed by our hauling contractor, Two flagmen will be stationed at the project location with two-way radios. There will also be a flagman stationed at nearby intersections, all in the interest of safety. Uh, at this time now, our architect will explain how the project design was reviewed by City of Los Angeles plan checkers uh, and address the hillside stability issue. And then our trucking company owner will explain the safety aspects of his operations. I ask that the committee deny the appellant's appeal. Thank you. Thank you. So, Vladimir Elmanovic. Yeah, Good afternoon. Uh, My name minute. is Vladimir Elmanovic. I'm an architect for the project. Uh, we're presenting this project second time to this plan committee. We presented it to uh, the city council, and we have passed two board of commissioners hearing for the whole route, um, and explaining uh, basically the same issues and I'll try to kind of bring the project design and issues brought out by appellant by Mr. Tom Stemnock uh, together. Uh, with me plans that uh, uh, reflects and corresponds to all current building codes that has been initial by the plan checker uh, ready for approval. We have uh, geologic reports that have also been uh, commented by Mr. Stemnock that are approved by the grading division. Um, following the last Plum Committee meeting, we have met uh, briefly with the... Thank you. Your, your time OCC. is up, sir. Okay. Your, your time is up. Thank you. Right. Orhan Aris. One minute. Good afternoon. Uh, I will be in charge with the trucking, like hauling the dirt uh, from... 1240 Angelina Drive, and then most likely we've been practice in the location. I done like few job before. I hope like everything is gonna be okay, and then I mean all the track is good condition. All the neighbors so worry about the walls on the turning, all the stuff. But all my driver like very professionally trained, and I hope everything is gonna be okay, and we'll do our best to make sure everything is safety. Also, thank you. Thank you, Steven Gallegos. Good afternoon. It's been a long one. <laughs> uh, my name is Stephen Geyers, and I just wanted to um, say plainly and simply that since we're just trying to haul dirt, move dirt so that we can build a home, a single family dwelling, not a mansion. It's um, uh, going to be in an area where um, we have one person who is a, a NIMBY, and you all knew what that is, not in my backyard. And uh, we continually come before um, this committee. We come before the board uh, building and safety committee. We keep getting approved. We keep getting to city council. And so we're hoping that um, that you deny the appeal and approve the hall route. Mr. Um, Giuliani was asked to communicate with the neighbors. He wrote a letter to the neighbors. I've got this as, as uh, material. Uh, Communication to the neighbors on Angelo Drive regarding the dirt hauling. I have several uh, emails that have been sent to us that we replied to and a letter from um, 
Mr. Koretz's office uh, okay. to us with questions that we answered and were forwarded to the appellant. Thank you. Sam Amir. Good afternoon. This is a civil rights problem. Mr. Stemnock, who's sitting here, specifically threatened me that Mr. Goldstein is rich and is going to prevent this project. Okay. Mr. Giuliani has been trying to build his house for last seven years. Five years, he has gotten all the plans to go forward. Each time, Mr. Goldstein used his power to prevent that. On May 24, all this team went to Mr. Koretz's office in Los Angeles on Wilshire Boulevard, waiting for them to show up. They did not show up. Mr. Stemnock clearly comes in front of this panel and makes false representation used to be considered a felony. There is a difference between civil, right of civil, what you call, right of free speech and making false representation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Faisal Alsari from Council Member Koretz's office. Council members, Good afternoon, Faisal Alsir on behalf of Councilmember Paul Koretz. Uh, we're pleased today with the progress made by the owner and his team. Uh, since, the, since the committee last heard this uh, property's haul route, uh, several uh, improvements have been made. We continue to receive a handful of concerned comments uh, relating to truck loading, turning, radiance allowances, and uh, what we are requesting today is that the Department of Building and Safety take these concerns um, seriously and monitor this haul route as it uh, commences. Uh, with that, we hope that you um, deny the appeal and move this item to Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments on this item? Okay, we'll move to uh, deny the haul route appeal and sustain the determination of the Board of Building and Safety Commissioners. Second by Mr. Cedillo. Any objection? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Uh, now we move on to public comment. Irma Villela. Villela. One minute public comment. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Irma Villela. As a, as a, I want to talk about the uh, rare habits discriminations uh, done as individuals with uh, disabilities, uh, the prohibits housing of rent is heavily um, against individuals under disabilities conditions. Uh, the Act C-504 also prohibits discriminations. Why uh, we all look at museum if not accommodation to provide disability recollection of support of Mr. Pri uh, Price of CD9 District Y. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Mickey Jackson. Mickey Jackson here, not here. Herman. No, I'm surprised that Mitch Englander, that white Jewish nigger asshole, can't stick around to hear public comment. He leaves every time. If you don't want to be a part of this commission, get the fuck out. I'll wave my hands, I'll sit there quietly, as long as I'm not dis a disruption to your fucking plum. Provide adequate housing, provide the conditions to give Mr. Giannulli his project and have it done. Seven fucking years, you racist bastards. Let the man build his fucking home so he can rest in peace like the other fucking assholes that sleep on your streets daily, the homeless population. We have a war on homelessness. Deal with it. Put it apart of your fucking plum conditions and fuck Lucas Museum and your fucking art redition there because you know what? You need more housing than you do a fucking museum in a white fucking neighborhood like Watts and CD9. Fuck all of you. 
believe that concludes our meeting. Thank you.